I am here with Dr. Jennifer Lackey, who is philosophy professor at Northwestern University. Thank you so much, Dr. Lackey, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. You're going to talk to us about the epistemology of groups. But before we get into that, can you just tell us what is epistemology? Sure. So epistemology is um, literally translated as the, the study of knowledge. Um, but there's a lot that falls under the heading of the study of knowledge. Knowledge has a lot of different components to it. Knowledge um, is typically taken to involve belief, to involve truth, to involve some sort of basis for believing truly. Um, traditionally, that was called justification. Other people have called it warrant. Um, and I think the most common way of understanding that basis would be in terms of just like evidence, for instance. So questions about evidence, questions about reasons, questions about how you arrived at a particular belief, those would all be like very standard questions that an epistemologist would be interested in. So, um, so knowledge and knowledge related questions. So sources of knowledge, things that interrupt the knowledge process, things um, that, so an epistemologist um, who is interested in, for instance, um, how we acquire knowledge on the internet might be interested in all of the interruptions, right? All of the ways in which knowledge is blocked because of, you know, massive um, fake news or, you know, people being in epistemic bubbles and, and that sort of thing. So all of those kinds of related issues um, are of interest to the epistemologist. So we're going to take all of those concepts and we're going to take those concepts and apply them to the idea of groups. But before we do, what do you mean by groups? So, I mean, that's actually, that's, that's, a, that's a difficult question um, to answer. <clears throat> so lots of different people um, mean different things by groups. So one of the things I actually even highlight in my book is how different starting points with respect to your conception of group can oftentimes impact the epistemology that you end up at. So if you start, like if you start with your paradigmatic group being something like, the Supreme Court or a jury, something that is very contained, um, overtly engages in deliberation, um, overtly, you know, kind of um, shares evidence, talks about evidence, um, and has in, in many respects policies and procedures about how they're supposed to function, you might end up at one conception of how that group can be said to know something. In contrast, if you start with something like the United States, right, or the Biden administration, or, um, you know, like, let's take like, like Philip Morris as, as a very large kind of, you know, kind of corporation, or, you know, even something as large as like Northwestern University. If you start with one of those, like, like kind of more dispersed, um, you know, not easy to engage in sort of collective deliberation type groups, um, you might end up at a very different place in your epistemology. So um, I try to not narrow down and say, like from a, from a, from a point of, like from a metaphysical point of view, you know, from a, a point of view about like what there, what there is in the world. I try to not say, here is the kind of group I'm interested in. Instead, I take the approach of saying, I'm coming at this from the perspective of wanting to be able to hold groups responsible. So if a group is subject to criticism or praise, then it's the kind of group I'm fundamentally interested in. So the one of the central motivations for, for, for my perspective for working on the epistemology of groups is providing a framework for being able to determine whether a group knew something, should have known something, was in a position to know something, so that we can hold that group responsible for its actions. So when I ask you to help us get a limit of what we mean by group, your answer is it's kind of complicated and it makes a difference. And you want us to kind of like reverse engineer, look at how we want to treat groups and then get our definition of what a group is from that? Pretty much. I want to say, if you think that a group 
is properly the subject of normative assessment. If you think that you can hold a group um, as being blameworthy or praiseworthy, then it's the kind of group that I think ought to be a part of the, the, the discussion in my book. Okay, what does it mean to apply norms to groups? So, um, I mean, essentially, I'm interested in whether we can say that they are responsible, they're praiseworthy, they did the right thing, they did the wrong thing. Um, I mean, I'm also interested in like questions on the ground, like when should they be subject to a lawsuit? When should they um, be punished? So I'm interested in those kind of more specific questions as well. But in terms of like the overall project, like the starting point, uh, I came at this much more from the perspective of, you know, when does it make sense to say um, that that group um, did something that was like morally heinous? I mean, I think that um, many people like, for instance, I mean, Philip Morris is like a really good example of a group that I think people are very apt and, and, and our legal institutions as well have been very, um, you know, kind of um, inclined toward holding them responsible for lying about the harmfulness of, of smoking. And so I think that when you have, um, that's the sort of uh, attribution, I want the epistemological framework that I provide to um, that's what I want the framework to capture. So why is it different or in what way is it different to attribute the action of lying to a group as opposed to attributing the action of lying to a person or an individual? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, so so one of the, the really foundational questions in, in any, any topic, not just the epistemology of groups, but anything you might be interested in groups. Are you interested in group emotion? Are you interested in, you know, kind of group testimony? Are you whatever you're interested in on the group side? One of the first questions that people ask is what is the relationship between groups and its members? Our, is, our, is our understanding of group really just the sort of thing that's fundamentally reducible to talking about individuals, the members, some, mem some, or, some members or other? Um, and so um, one of the kind of most dominant kinds of arguments that you see in this literature, and again, not just in the epistemology, think about any sort of group phenomenon you might be interested in. And there is, yeah, so like group lies, group belief, group action, group responsibility, group knowledge, things I don't cover in the book, group intentions, group emotions, anything that you might think about. There's what's called divergence arguments. And these divergence arguments purport to show that groups have these states over and above the states of their individual members. And in this sense, like groups, like what, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a phrase that like a philosopher uses, Philip Pettit is, they have minds of their own. And, and a, a lot of philosophers mean this like in a fairly robust sense. So what they do is they provide kind of examples and cases and then argue to the conclusion that a group can have a state that no individual member of that group has. So if it makes sense to say here is a clear case where a group believes that smoking is harmful, but no individual member of that group believes that smoking is harmful, then clearly groups are over and above any individual member in a very robust sense, because there's no individual belief to anchor that. It simply can't be the sort of state that, a, that, a, that an individual has. And so if you think that these divergence arguments are compelling, if, you, if, you, if you're pulled by that, if you feel the, the pull of it, then you're probably going to end up being what I call an inflationary theorist, which says that these groups, group states, like group belief or group knowledge or something like that, is over and above any state that an individual might, it's, might, might have. You used the word reduce, mm -hmm. and it sounded like you were hinting that there's these two opposite ways to look. One's uh, a reducing and ones that over and above -ing. can you help bring out this contrast? Yeah. So if you, so I call the, the, uh, the other side, the side that's out on more of like the reducing side, um, def deflationary theorists. And those views would say group belief just is 
the summing up of individual beliefs. That's all it is. And so um, in that sense, we might say that, so, so there's two different ways of thinking about this. One is that group talk is just metaphorical. There are just no th such things as group belief or group knowledge. That's just metaphorical talk. It's like shorthand. Do you know what I mean? What we really mean is that there's like an individual or something, but it's, it's just metaphorical. The other view is what we might call a reductionist view. And that view says that group belief or group knowledge um, is, is just the beliefs or knowledge states of those individual members. So this is reducible to this, meaning, you know, kind of, it really is just amounts to the summing up of these group belief states. And both of those views, um, group belief is, is really deeply anchored, in fact, like grounded in individual states. And so if you, if you have that kind of view, you might just think like, we don't even really need a group epistemology because it's just summing up the epistemology of individuals and we, we have an epistemology of individuals. So we don't really need anything extra. Um, and it sounds like you probably have some kind of case in mind that shows that there is a group mind that is not just a matter of the individuals together. Could you give us a kind of case to help us understand what you have in mind? Yeah, so I myself don't end up endorsing these um, divergence cases, but I'll, I'll give you some of the, the paradigmatic examples. So there's a couple of different kinds. One we might call compromise cases. So these are the cases where um, suppose that there's like a teenage child in a house and there's two parents and one thinks that the, the, the daughter shouldn't stay out till midnight until she's 18. And the other thinks that the daughter shouldn't stay out till midnight till she's 16. And so they're like, okay, well, we need to be a united front here. Uh, we'll just settle on 17, we'll compromise. And so the parents as a collective, now it's a really small collective, it's just two, okay? But you can imagine like the, the structure of it, right? Doesn't depend on there just being two. Um, they, they defend that to the daughter. They give reasons for that to the daughter whenever they're speaking as a unified front, um, it's always 17. But like when they're out for like, you know, kind of drinks with a friend or something, they might say, well, I personally think that it should be 18. But we as parents, say that it's 17. And so the idea there is that the belief, you know, you shouldn't stay out past midnight until you're 17 is something that's had by the group, but no individual member has that belief. Wow. That's one kind of case. Another kind of case that sometimes is used would be like, we might call like official position cases or something like that. And that might be like a jury, um, where they, um, have inadmissible evidence or, or that they're that they're exposed to or just kind of like a personal pull towards a per, towards a belief and so every juror might believe that the defendant is guilty but on the basis of the admissible evidence um they might quad jury have to say that the juror is not guilty that the, i'm sorry that the defendant is not guilty so why not endorse these kinds of cases it it seems like it's kind of clear that there's something going on with the group that's not going on with the individuals, but you don't endorse it. Can you help us understand why? Yeah, I don't. I'm not as persuaded by these cases as they are presented in the literature. And um, I mean, I have both like so I have my responses to the individual cases, but I also have a lot of arguments against the views, the positive views that emerge from these cases. So let's just start with the cases. The cases, in a way, I, I respond to the cases very much at the end of the book, not at the end, but like near the ends of the re relevant chapters. And the reason for that is because I think that the views that these views give rise to are deeply problematic, like deeply problematic. So in a way, what I do for the reader is I motivate the views. I show what the views, are, the, the, like the really dominant views in the literature are. And then I raise what I think are very serious problems with these views. And then I come back around and I say, okay, well, now that we've seen these problems with these views, what are we gonna do about the motivating cases? And then I, I, I try to explain away the intuitive force of the motivating cases. So I just think that we already have, even at the individual level, lots and lots of tools and distinctions for capturing these phenomena in a way that does not 
all lead us to posit group belief. So in my own case, I might say to my children, it, just as an individual, I personally think you probably shouldn't be staying out till midnight until you're 18. But I'm going to go ahead and adopt the position of 17 just because um, I can see that it's very important to you. Now, we wouldn't describe me as both believing that it's 18 and believing that it's 17, right? I mean, like that would be like an incoherent position. As an individual, we have a very easy way of describing what just happened. I believe it's 18, but I've adopted the position that it's 17. Some of the terms in the literature are acceptance. So a lot of people draw a distinction between acceptance and belief. I accept the proposition. Um, other people would say I'm in a position to know. Um, it's an official position. It's I've judged. So in the jury case, we might say they delivered the verdict, not guilty. We don't have to say that they believe it. They delivered the verdict, not guilty. Here's another one. They judged that she's that the, the defendant is not guilty. So we have a lot of nuanced language at our fingertips that we use in the individual case. And I see no reason why we have to kind of radically shift in the group case to saying, oh, that's belief too. Because in the individual case, we wouldn't say that. We would just say, I accept the proposition for the purposes of keeping my relationship with my child, you know, um, like free of tension or something like that, right? So if we um, continue with this case and ask a little bit more about it, I mean, I'm wondering not just the different mental states like belief, acceptance, judge mm -hmm. that we might use to explain what's going on. But what about agency? For example, let's say you're the mother in this case, then maybe could we say that uh, personally you have this thought, but when you're thinking about yourself as a member of the group, you and your partner, you're of a different mind. Uh, is there something about agency going back and forth? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that um, in some respects that might like be maybe what you just said, it's possible it's neutral between the two views or it could favor the more inflationary readings of the cases. So I think you're right that um, we might say like, personally, I believe that P, um, but you know, so, so let's just start with the individual level because I find that it's just helpful to apply that. I might say personally, I believe that P, but I'm the chair of the department here and I have to follow the rules of the department. So I have to the kind of rule such and such. Again, I just don't think in such a case we would say I'm of two minds. I have a belief, my belief is P, but I have to judge or rule not P because of my official position. And I, I guess I'm just inclined to say something very similar that we would say personally, um, I believe that P, um, but you know, kind of in this context, I have to judge that P or I've got to accept that P or I've got to rule that P and so on because of you know various practical and you know policy driven constraints. Um, so I, I guess I'm inclined to say that since we wouldn't attribute belief in the individual case, I don't think we should do that in the group case either. So thinking more about this chair example, like speaking as the chair of the department, uh, is there a way in which whoever talks on behalf of the group has some kind of responsibility or power or something in addition to just being an individual? Yeah, so absolutely. So I mean, this kind of like segues really nicely into some of the other chapters I have in the book. So um, I perhaps kind of strangely in some ways have um, two kind of different positions in the book. So when it comes to states like group belief and group knowledge, group justified belief, um, I um, require of those, of those um, phenomena, that there be the grounding of individual states. So I'm not a deflationary theorist and I'm, I'm happy to explain why. I don't know how much detail you want me to go into there. But with respect to like group belief, for instance, I don't think that a group can believe a proposition or believe something when no individual member of that group believes it. 
But I also don't think that group belief is just reducible to the to the beliefs of individual members. So that's why my view, I would say that it has kind of a, an anchor you know, it requires some anchoring um, in individual states, but there is a robust component of my view that makes for epistemic agents that are over and above the 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 age the individual epistemic agents. So that's my view about like belief and knowledge and justified group belief. When you get to things like assertion, so you were talking about asserting something like the chair of the department saying something and bearing responsibility. Um, I have a bit of a different view, which is. Um, you might think like, why? And I, I have a principled answer. So the answer is when you can grant authority to another person to be a proxy agent, that is to do something on your behalf that's constitutive of your act, then I am a more robustly inflationary theorist. Okay, so I think that I can grant authority to someone to act on my behalf. I can have a, um, you know, like I can grant someone power of attorney, right? I can grant someone authority to speak on my behalf, to assert on my behalf. Um, I can hire an attorney to do that for me, right? Um, I can hire, you know, kind of, um, you know, someone, to, someone to, to kind of buy a house in my absence, but I can't grant someone the authority to believe on my behalf. And that's what I think are the differences, right? I think that, um, so in other words, I think that um, the chair of my department can speak on behalf of the whole group. And I think that there is a kind of group assertion, which I call authority-based group assertion, where a spokesperson, and I mean that in kind of a loose sense, it doesn't have to be like an official, like I, I kind of appoint you spokesperson. A spokesperson has the authority to speak on behalf of a group and that assertion is constitutive of the group's assertion. And so technically, I actually don't think that when the chair of my department goes to the dean and says, the philosophy department wants to hire in ethics, I don't think that the chair of the department is asserting. I think the group is asserting. So, um, and, and I have some arguments for that. But what that means is that a group can assert where no individual member of the group asserts. And because of that, I'm a robust, I have, like, like I would say, I'm a ro robust inflationary theorist when it comes to things like group assertion, group lying, group action. So it sounds like your principled answer justifies having these two different positions. Something you didn't talk about, which I, I invite you to speak about now, is, is the difference also having to do with how knowing and believing and being justified is all in your own head, but then asserting and acting is an overt action? Mm -hmm. is, does that play any role here? I mean, yeah, I mean, it, you know, kind of might um, have something something to do with it in that, um, I mean, I think one of the reasons I can grant someone authority to do something on my behalf is because it is something in the world, right? I mean, it's like, I can say, you go do this on my behalf and I, I sign a document. And I say, you have the authority to go do it. Go buy my house, right? Go, go, you know, go, go, plea, you know, go say that I'm entering a not guilty plea. Go do that, right? I mean, and I can, you can do things, you know, on my behalf so that the defendant end up, ends up entering a not guilty plea, you know, but someone else is doing it on their behalf. So, um, whereas, I mean, I think that it, you know, and, and maybe it is like ultimately linked up with um, kind of the nature of belief that it is something that's inside my head, right? It is something that, um, for many of my belief states, I have some sort of introspective access to, um, you know, that it seems like much, much harder, like, what does it mean for me to say, like, I'm giving you the authority to believe on my behalf, right? So all of a sudden, you're like, uh, you believe that you're six feet tall. And I'm like, right. And what it's so I think, you know, I think that there probably is something to that. 
Um, I kind of ground it in when can you grant authority to someone else to do something? But I mean, I think you're right that like the kind of the nature in a way of belief versus action might be part of the explanation of why I can grant authority in some cases and not others. Okay, moving on from this, um, let me just make sure I have your view down. Your view is that you can attribute a assertion to a group, even though none of the individuals have asserted it. Okay. That's right. So how does that track holding groups responsible without holding the individuals responsible? Yeah. So, um, so I, um, so first of all, I mean, I say in the book, right, like you, you should choose your proxy agents wisely, right? Because your spokespersons or your, you know, your, your, you know, someone who has, um, power of attorney, it's going to be making important decisions, right? Like make sure that it's done. Like, you know, make sure that, you know, you, you make these choices wisely. I do draw a distinction between someone doing a bad job. So someone being a bad spokesperson and someone being a rogue spokesperson. So um, I th a bad spokesperson is someone who doesn't do a very good job at asserting what they think you would you would be asserting or at like kind of paying attention to what you would want them to assert. Like that just might be a bad spokesperson. But when you have a bad spokesperson, I want to say you've still asserted. So if like the White House has a bad spokesperson and that person says, um, you know, the Biden administration is not going to support, is not supporting, you know, is not going to support blah, blah, blah. Um, the Biden administration did assert that, um, even if the spokesperson kind of got it wrong. In contrast, a rogue spokesperson is someone who speaks without having the authority to do it. And that might be, suppose that like I hire an attorney to speak on my behalf with respect to like real estate matters, but then they get up and say, um, you know, Florida is her favorite destination, right? Like that, that spokesperson has no authority, like that lawyer has no authority to speak on my behalf about like my favorite destinations, right? And so that's not my assertion. That spokesperson has gone rogue. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that um, there are some cases where we've granted someone the authority to speak on our behalf in a domain and they go outside that domain and that's not our assertion. But if you grant someone the authority to act on your behalf or to, you know, to speak on your behalf and they just do a really bad job, that still is your assertion. It would be comparable to like you having like a really bad day or having me medication that interacts with you like in a problematic way or, you know, something like that. Like there might be things that kind of just fall out of your mouth that like in retrospect, you're like, God, what, what was I doing? You know what I mean? Like, that's not my view. You know what I mean? You still asserted it. Do you know what I mean? You still did. So suppose that you like you were in like, a, you know, you were with your friend or a partner and like you were just having a terrible day and you said something that you don't at all mean, like you still said it. You should apologize. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So you, that you, doesn't count as rogue. That does not count as rogue. Now, mm. if I. Um, I'm somehow able to like connect to you and like, I, you know, you're more like a puppet and that would be more like rogue. Do you know what I mean? Um, because, um, you know, you wouldn't even be, it wouldn't even be something that it wouldn't be like a bad assertion. So I think like bad assertions are ones where, um, you know, like we, we do say it, but we just kind of get like, it's, it's connection with reality wrong. Um, but rogue, rogue ones are ones where we just don't, it just goes beyond the authority. We just don't even really have the authority to do, to be doing it. 